Good morning, everyone. My name is Tina Lee. Today we're having a special guest, Michael Gates. Michael works as a professor at Oxford Business School. He's also the managing director of Michael Gates Cross Culture. Good. Good morning, Michael. Morning. Really nice to see you again, Tina. How are you today? I'm doing all right. Thank you. A warm Good. welcome. There are many uh, talented young people who are inspired to go to elite universities such as Cambridge, Oxford in the UK. And I know that you graduated from Oxford University. And then at the moment, you also work as a professor teaching negotiation at Oxford Business School. So how do you design your course and what are the main uh, objectives? Well, the main course I teach on at Oxford is called the Oxford Programme on Negotiation. Mm -hmm. It's one of the world's top negotiation courses. And um, the Oxford Business School does extremely well internationally. It's definitely number one in the UK, and it's usually in the top two or three as a business school in the world oh, okay. for executive education. Mm -hmm. And um, the course that I teach, the open course, it's a week long. And we have many different professors on it doing different types of lessons. And I specialize on the cultural side. So they begin by looking at some of the psychological influences and biases in negotiation. Mm -hmm. They're introduced to different types of negotiation, some of them quite simple, just pure bargaining and then some very complex multi-party, multilateral negotiations. Yeah. Mm. They um, look at um, uh, integrative negotiation, they look at um, distributed negotiation, mm -hmm. and many different things. And there are many different uh, role plays and case studies from real life that are used. And then I come in and say, well, you know, you've been looking at um, some of the psychological influences, and um, today we're going to look at the cultural influences on negotiation and um, and so it's important to uh, integrate what you do with what has come before with the other professors and what's coming after from you and so um, you, for example if I look at trust they've probably already looked at trust in a general context but then I say well the way in which you build trust with different cultures it can be um, you know quite quite different and so, for example, if you're building trust with Germans, you probably need to show your reliability and your technical competence and that you always do what you say you're going to do, that you are consistent. Um, if I were talking about building trust with the Chinese, it might be more about building a relationship, mm -hmm. um, about uh, reciprocity. So, if, you know, you did something for me. Um, a favor and so I've done something back to help you and also people who are polite and people who at a meeting don't make other people lose face so the way in which trust is built is rather different we all need trust but we build it in different ways mm -hmm. just really look at into the uh, key terms in detail from country to country yeah mm -hmm. and, and also um the, the approach that I use, which many cross-culturalists do, is to use a model of culture. Yeah. And so you can't, in, say, a half-day session, uh, cover every culture in the world. So the model I use is mainly the, the Lewis model of culture. Yeah. And it divides cultures into three main types, what we call linear active cultures. And Germans would tend to be quite linear. Mm. Um, Americans are quite linear, Brits are quite linear, but there are still, of course, differences between linear cultures, but they tend to focus on facts and figures and they're fairly transactional. Uh, then we look at what we call multi-active cultures, and those would tend to be Southern Europe, um, Latin America, and they're very people focused. And so they're not as interested in all the facts and figures, but they're interested in what you feel about them and what your opinions are. And they're very interested in um, people-oriented um, transactions and decisions. So taking emotion into account. And then finally, we look at reactive cultures, which would include China and many of the East Asian cultures. 
and they're about all the things that I mentioned with trust, about reciprocity, harmony. And then a key thing, if you think about communication, is that reactives spend a lot of time listening rather than initiating. They want to collect a lot of information about you. They want to understand you. They want to listen before putting forward their point of view in general. Yeah, I can imagine that it'd be fascinating to be in your course and listen to your insights. It's, I have to be careful not to use interest in this word. It's interesting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, so we've mentioned some uh, uh, many talented young people. And then according to Oxford University statistics, and I think last year in 2020, there were around uh, let me have a look, 23,000 people applied for undergrad study with only 3,300 places available. So the yeah. competition is very fierce, right? Yeah, I think, I think the average, um, I haven't done the maths there, but I think the average in general is about five people competing for one place. But that depends very much as well on the subject. So some subjects are easier to get into, others are much more difficult. And... Um, the most difficult of the lot nowadays is a course at Oxford called Philosophy, Politics and Economics. And it's been running for over 100 years now. And traditionally, I mean, at, at, at Oxford, particularly also at Cambridge, the, the most prestigious subject have been Latin and Greek, what they call classics. Yeah. At Oxford, they call it great. And Philosophy, Politics and Economics was introduced as um, an alternative to looking at ancient history and philosophy and politics, um, to looking at more modern um, subjects uh, or more a more modern application of those things. So it's like a replacement for the old Latin and Greek philosophy, politics and economics. Why is it so difficult to get into? Because it's a very good route into a career particularly in politics, but then also into the media and journalism. And oh. so if you look at um, politicians in the UK, mm -hmm. particularly the ones who are become government ministers or prime ministers, yeah. and if you look at the key uh, most well-known journalists and uh, people on in the media, um, very, very many of them have studied philosophy, politics and economics at Oxford. I mean, it's staggering the high percentage who have done that. If you look at, on Wikipedia, any famous British politicians, look at what they studied, um, it's very often going to be philosophy, politics and economics. And that's why it's so difficult to get into, because people see it as the stepping stone to uh, a career in, in politics or the media. Right. It's really nice to know that. I tell my students, if they want to be uh, Prime Minister, they should uh, study <laughs> philosophy and uh, politics. Politics and economics. That's right. <laughs> yes. And I know that except uh, the um, academic excellency, those kinds of entries, uh, interviews of uh, paramount importance, what kind of qualities uh, are those elite universities, of course, we're talking about Oxford and Cambridge, uh, looking for in an applicant? And how can people prepare uh, for it? Well, it's... Um... They have quite a difficult job because nearly these days, nearly everyone who applies to Oxford or Cambridge has perfect results in their school leaving exams. So like if they take three or four subjects, they've got A or A starred in everything. So they have to decide between people who have the same results in public national examinations. So they base it very much or at least they did when I was there, I think they still do, on two things. One is they have their own entrance exam, um, which they put more faith in than your results in the public exams. And then the interview is very important. And what is unique at Oxford and Cambridge is that, I mean, maybe there are a few other universities do it, but it's particularly associated with them, is that the person or people interviewing you are going to be your main tutors during your time there. And so you have to make some sort of connection with them because they know that they're going to be teaching you for three or four years. And so they want to have people that they personally like and that they feel some sort of intellectual connection to. And 
what they tend to be looking for even more than achievement is potential and especially the ability to think for yourself so if it's someone who's obviously been very well taught and tutored in order to pass exams that's not enough for them what they want is someone who thinks independently is prepared to put up arguments for um, positions and points of view which are maybe unpopular so if you can defend an idea which most people don't agree with and you defend it very well that's seen as a, a good sign um, and um, if you can express those things in a simple way not using jargon um, but in words that anyone can understand uh, that simplicity is valued as well because there's a, a feeling there that good thought is very clear thought which is easy to understand um, and then i think you also need to show a much wider interest in your subject than you would have um, had to go through purely following the reading list for exams so for example in my subject english literature um which i went uh, to study uh, they weren't so interested in what books you studied for a level but if you were able to say well i love chaucer and i particularly like the way in which chaucer was influenced by medieval italian literature boccaccio for example mm -hmm. then that would be very much in your favor because you'd read outside the reading list or if you were talking about modernist poetry and drew a parallel with um the um, art paintings or music of that time mm -hmm. and said you know, similar trends were going on not just in literature but also in art and, and music and you know one could be, compare the way in which Picasso used cubism to the way in which T.S. Eliot um, uh, structured the uh, his poem The Wasteland mm -hmm. um, a sort of mosaic of different images then that would get you a lot of um, credibility as well rather than just say well these were the books i studied and these are the only ones that i've read right okay uh -huh. this is a lot of uh, useful information and i think this is exactly what the young people need so it's not really about well of course academic excellency is very important but it's only really part of it and then uh, as you just mentioned the communication is very important you need to not only prove that so you uh, you are really good at at a certain areas but also a competent communicate a communicator to be able yeah. to bring your ideas out in a very simple and a clear way right absolutely and i think the other the final thing i would say is that it's very important to do your research on the particular college and tutors where you're applying because you have to choose. You not only have to choose the university, but with Oxford and Cambridge, you have to choose which college you're applying to. And it's very easy to just go and research, particularly these days. Yeah. You know, what are, what are the particular interests of the tutors who will be interviewing you? And so, for example, if you find that, um, and again, I have to use my subject because it's easiest for me, but for instance, my tutor was a world authority on um, a 17th century poet Andrew Marvell now Andrew Marvell wasn't as well known as some of the other um, poets of that era and so if somehow in your interview you can talk about um, their particular area of interest and and also other less well known writers who um, were writing at the time rather than the obvious ones and make a case for why they are great, then again, that would be very useful for you. It is a rather a privilege and a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much indeed, Michael.